All right, so for our last talk for today, we are very, very, very lucky to have an expert here who uh, is, um, uh, has a really, really cool talk for us. It's called Learn uh, La Language Learning Models from Zero to Hero. And um, so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Andrea Montano. Thank you. And I hope you can hear me. Thank you, everyone, for staying until so late. I know by now we're all thinking of beers and having dinner and all these things. So I'll try to, to make it interesting for everyone. Um, to start by introducing myself, I'm Andrea Montano. I work with Canonical. I'm an AI product manager. I have a background in data science uh, and machine learning, especially in retails and telcos. But at some point, because I was too frustrated to deal with all the tools, I changed places. I joined the product team in order to build solutions that are actually easy for data scientists, machine learning engineers. This talk is going to be introductory and is going to talk about large language models as well as how you can benefit from open source. I'm a, I'm a big believer in open source. I love communities that leverage open source. Um, so let's not make it any longer. So I'll tell you how it all started. It was two years ago, ChatGPT popped up. I was about to go on holidays and I was telling one of my coworkers, I really wanna go to the Maldives, I love diving. She said, fine Andrea, you can go, just do it. Okay, okay, that's Gen AI, uh, but that's how I got introduced to large language models. And if you're just getting started in this industry, I think there is a lot of confusion between Gen AI, LLMs, and that's all right. Um, but today we'll focus on large language models. And for those who are not familiar with it, they refer to models that use deep learning techniques to capture complex patterns, to produce text. They usually train on self-supervised learning, and they are beyond the scene of large transformers. Well, let's look a bit more in depth at them, because Large language models are large. They are trained on data sets with many parameters. GPT-3, which was the one that I looked at when I prepared this talk a couple of months ago now, had more than 100 billion parameters. And let me tell you something, GPT-4, it's at least double the size and it has more parameters. It has also been trained, GPT-3, just to make clear, on 45 terabytes of text and that's why it's so capable. It has the language part because it mainly operates on human language. And then, of course, it's, it has the models part because they are used to find models or make predictions within the data. Look, whereas we all look at LLMs nowadays or in the last two years, whatever, we are not really at the beginning of this journey. I remember when I started with machine learning, it was 10 years ago, and everyone was telling me, Andrea, you're doing unicorns. But machine learning was also around for quite some time. I think it's the same with LLMs. Uh, they became famous a couple of years ago, two to three years, but the truth is that around the, the, in the 900s, or towards the second part of the 900s, people started looking at the idea or exploring the idea of LLMs by building basic rules. As you may imagine, that didn't fly out very well because it was too manual, it was not adaptable, it was not scalable, so they dropped it. Um, in the 2020, it's the year that I think large language models became very popular, and nowadays you have plenty of options that we will talk about in a second. But then, who can use large language models? Do you have a use case? Just raise your hand if you know of a use case that could benefit two, three, four people. Five, don't be shy, Jason has one as well. Uh, so there are plenty of use cases. Some of them are very familiar. Uh, we all use ChatGPT, right? And chatbots are familiar, but then the applications go beyond it. You can use it for text generation, story writing, marketing content. You can use it for summarization. I don't know how many of you stay in long meetings. I do. I have six hours meetings a day. So if someone can summarize my meeting notes, I'm very happy for that. Translations as well, uh, it's very important and it's useful, especially in environments where English is not your native language or you struggle with it. English is not my native language. And if I'm tired, I might switch to Romanian. 
I'm not jet lagged anymore, so we are fine. And then last but not least, classification. For example, in marketing, again, there are a lot of sentiment analysis that's being done and LLMs are important. One thing that I want to say here is that whereas large language models have applications across all industries from having chatbots in retail who tell you what are the latest offers to sentiment or to, to telcos companies who are looking at how you talk about the latest offering to see if they keep it or not, you should always look at the use case. Don't use large language models just for the sake of it. That's not how you should do it. You should start with a problem to solve. What does it bother you every day? Does it bother you that you have to go through 20 pages of meeting notes? Okay, let's summarize them, that's great. But if you just do it for, for the sake of doing it, it might be fun, but it might not give you results that you're very happy with. That's where it, comes, it becomes interesting. Large language models versus traditional machine learning. I already told you, I, I started with machine learning when it was not that nice. I was looking and working especially on structured data. And that's a question that I get often at conferences as well as with customers. I, through, the, through my role, I get the chance to meet a lot of companies and most of them say they wanna use large language models or they wanna do Gen AI, but they have no use case. So I say, why not traditional machine learning? And the question is, what's the difference? Well, LLMs are specialized in NLP, or natural language processing, and they are designed to handle structured data. But however, they are not specialized in image analysis or ranking structured data tasks, for example. Because, and there are other machine learning algorithms and models, such as linear regression, that are more suitable. So, the main question is, what do you choose? LLMs or traditional machine learning? It all depends on your use case. It's very easy. However, there are some benefits that LLMs might have, and you have to bear them in mind. On one hand, you get improved performance nowadays. They, they, they do get better results on NLP-specific tasks. And often, they sur surpass the traditional approaches that have been on the market. They accelerate the learning, so often you can use them for your use case with leader training or leader optimization to no optimization. And last but not least, they have multilingual capabilities. In Canonical, I think it was six months ago, we were playing with some of uh, our colleagues, and we managed to build a chatbot that was answering in Afrikaani. The reason why we tried Afrikaan is because we are South African and Mark was curious about it. It answered quite correctly, and I said, okay, I'll try it in Romanian as well. It answered in Romanian as well, to the point where I, I started using characters that are not in the normal English language. In the same area, there are nowadays LLMs specialized in unusual languages, such as uh, Urdu. It's something that picked up very quickly. Uh, it was, uh, it's an LLM that was developed, it's open source, it was developed in um, UAE by a Pakistani startup, and I know about them just because I'm based there. How do you take these LLMs to production, or how do you actually move away from just the idea of, ah, it exists, so I can use it? It's with MLOps. Are you familiar with the concept of MLOps? Let's see. Some people, yes? Okay. I, I still define it as DevOps for machine learning, and those who have been in the MLOps space for a long time will feel like killing me. But that's the shortest definition. It's it's a new practice, or it's not that new anymore, and it aims to take machine learning projects to production in a scalable and repeatable manner. But the truth is that I get a lot of complaints. Training is resource heavy. I need a lot of compute power, it's expensive. Yes or no, you're right, but then that's why you can use pre-trained models such as Olama, for example, or Olama 2, they are trained, you need to optimize them, but that's much cheaper, it requires less resources. Nowadays, you also have the public clouds, for example, that can give you the access to more powerful compute machines. And to, to maybe put it in context, when, we tra when we've built our own chatbot, that I will share a bit later, um, the architecture, it was costing us 50 cents for each half an hour. So it's okay, if you just wanna play with it, it's not very expensive. Uh, at the same time, you should look at capabilities such as, uh, or features such as GPU sharing tools such as Volcano, which is open source, are very great for that, as well as the idea of distributed training and using frameworks such as Paddle Paddle. 
costs are high. That's what companies tell us. It's too expensive. We don't want to do it. We don't want to train our own model. Again, you don't have to train your model. You can just optimize your model. However, there are also things that you can look at. And the most important part is that you can use open source tooling. It enables you to get started at a lower cost. And then as you scale, of course, your cost, or you can invest more in it. Uh, and it's very important to mention here that unlike any other innovation that I've seen on the market, AI is fully open source or is naturally open source. There are big communities around it, and the latest tools, latest innovations, they happen in open source communities and in an open source space. Also, you should always think of your long-term strategy and think of hybrid clouds. You start on a public cloud, as I told you, because you don't have enough resources, but then once you want to scale, you can always move on-prem. You can always consider HPC clusters that Jason's talked about, and there's nothing to, to stop you from that. You start on one cloud, you move towards a, a hybrid cloud scenario or a multi-cloud scenario, depending on your needs, where you store your data. But that's not all. It's not reproducible, you know? I have a team of 20 data scientists. They all do the same thing. They, they get a the result, they don't know how to get back to it. I think a lot of data science still happens in small black boxes that people don't know about. And that's when you should think of open source tools again. I feel like I'm a broken machine saying open source, open source a million times, but I think that's the answer in the AI space. Tools such as Kubeflow or MLflow enable reproducibility. On one hand, you can do, you can have capabilities such as experiment tracking, which is very easy, but then you can also build pipelines, automate your work in order to make it seamless for your teams. That's what I've done at home. I stopped coding at some point, but I still enjoy doing fun things. And it was really after I played with ChatGPT, I said, can I build my own chatbot? It's easy. Uh, when, you, when you look at it, it all starts with a user who queries something. That query goes into the embeddings model, and then it goes into the open search, which is basically a vector database where all your prompts are stored. But that it's not all from there, the data or the search for, the similar searches are retrieved. And they going through the open source model, you get an answer. Of course, not all the answers are good or depending on how niche your topic is, if you, if you ask about something that is not really available on the internet, I'm not sure if that's possible, uh, then the answer might not be accurate, but that's when you look at this. That's when you look at the more real-world example that's designed not just to be your pet projects, but something that people can use. And there are a couple of more capabilities that you need to ensure. On one hand, that you fine-tune or you optimize your open source or your LLM with data that you have. Assuming you want to build a chatbot about your offerings in a telco company, Maybe it's not the best example, but then you should use that data that you have about your offerings, about what customers usually ask to optimize an existing model. At the same time, and then you should also do it in an automated, reliable manner. I don't know, it updates once a month with the latest data. But then also, you should ensure that similarly, all your data is stored in a vector database all your searches are, and prompts are stored in a vector, vector database, and then when a user queries, the answer gets similarly to, to the other one. So, LLMs projects can be done with open source. Everything that I have here is open source. I've done it on my own, I didn't pay much. On one hand, you have open source models, and I think that's what interesting for those who are familiar with the ML world, probably they are also familiar with Hugging Faces. That's where you're gonna find a lot of models. But then, not all of them are LMs, but then there are also open source tools that can be used to build your own models, to fine tune existing models. And open source, one sec, sorry, no, there we are. Open source large language models, I can give you easily some examples, Llama 2, Mistral, these are the ones that I think are Falcon as well. 
are the most used ones, have some benefits. It's easy to get started. There is nothing to, to stop you. I, had, I, I said earlier in the day that Olama is also snapped, but I think we have some technical difficulties here. I don't want to say it. You can try it out, but you might run into some problems. But it's also cost efficient. You don't need to train your model. Training a model on billions of parameters can be expensive. Not everyone can afford it. I couldn't. And also, I wouldn't want to invest my money in that, even if I would have the money, because I don't know. I would rather go on a holiday than train models and buy resources. Um, it also gives you flexibility because I'm 100% sure that there is more data available on the internet than you have in your own uh, machine. And then it benefits from community support. I, I was not an open source enthusiast before I got into the machine learning world. But the truth is that in the ML space, there is really an active community that you can ask, that's very passionate. Uh, and then there's also a matter of code transparency. You can always see what goes in, what goes out. At the same time, there are concerns. I'm not going to say that everything is pink and, and great, because often there are questions about privacy. And uh, especially highly regulated industries have some concerns about it. Um, I can easily think of healthcare, for example. That's why they've been looking at confidential computing as an alternative to, to further optimize their models. But then there's also lack of support and lack of enterprise support, especially, which can be challenging. And then the learning curve is not that easy. Your first three months in the machine learning world are going to be very, very frustrating, I would say. I don't want to disappoint anyone. I don't want to scare anyone. But it's annoying. It's just a completely new world. Um, it's a lot of data. Sometimes, at least when I started, it was also there was not so much compute power, which I would start training something, it dies halfway through. How do I do it? How do I debug it? It can be annoying. And then there are some security risks as well, which are really related to the vulnerabilities that the packages that you use can benefit. There you go. I knew I had a slide with this. It's also interesting to look at Langchain. It's not a large language model per se. It's a framework, but it's widely adopted in this space. Tools. Do we know open source tools that we are using in the machine learning world? Come on. There is one that everyone uses, I'm sure. No? Jupyter Notebooks, no? Okay, yes. I think it all starts with Linux uh, and Ubuntu. Uh, then it goes towards Jupyter Notebooks, Python, PyTorch. There, there are plenty of programming languages and tools. And again, it's easy to get started, which I like it. You, I know. It's easy to deploy Jupyter Notebooks. Everyone can do it, I guess. Or if they don't do it, again, they, they look on the community forums, and they will find the answers. Even if it fails, it's going to fail a couple of times, but in the end, it works. Uh, it enables customization. I'm not sure how much or if you've tried tools that are already made, such as uh, the public cloud solutions, but then they're very rigid. They, they give you a solution that works well, but if you have different needs or if you want to try something new, especially if you're in an exploration phase, they are not that flexible. Uh, and then it also... It's not something that in the machine learning world we talk that much. But open source tools give you the ability to contribute. And especially if you're just getting started uh, or you, you like contributing, you, you like making the world a better place, you really can do it. And projects such as Kubeflow, which I'm active in, really appreciate contributors. Con by contributions, I have to say, I don't really think only of code. I'm one of those that think that code is not the only way to contribute to a project. You can contribute by writing documentation. You can contribute by providing feedback. You can contribute by trying the product and building a nice tutorial. There are plenty of ways to do it. Don't just think of code. Because especially if you want to do a data science, it's maybe unlikely that you will want to contribute a lot to how the project is built. But you can provide a lot of feedback. That is very valuable. And that's how I started in the Kubeflow community. I tried to deploy it, and I couldn't. I failed dramatically. So I went on the community chat, and I said, hey, this documentation is outdated. I don't know why it doesn't work. 
Uh, in the end, I think uh, we've learned why, and we also improved it. There are, of course, some down downsides. Um, security, lack of support, similar documentation. I just told you what happens, right? Uh, Jason told you what happens with the documentation. He thinks that the code is the best documentation, but not everyone knows how to read the code, so documentation is important. <laughs> but also bug fixing, whereas it's in, you can suggest bug fixes, it might take a bit longer. I asked you about tools. Well, when it comes to large language models and tools that can be used, I'll take them one by one. Kubeflow is an end-to-end -end MLOps platform. It was a project that was started by Google five, six years ago. It's quite some time. Now it's part of the Cloud Foundation, Cloud Native Foundation. Um, it's a suite of tools. The way that it was designed, it was to have to be a suite of famous or leading open source tools that can enhance the machine learning project. So it has Jupyter Notebooks in integrated um, for the training part, especially. It has Katib for model optimization. It has KServe for model serving. Um, and then it has Kubeflow pipelines, which I think are the heart of Kubeflow. Uh, and they're really used as MLOps pipelines to automate machine learning workloads. Then you have MLflow, which is used for experiment tracking especially, and model registry. It's, I think, the most famous machine learning tool on the market. It's super easy to use it. It's the thing that whenever you get started, it's easy to install it. It's very intuitive as well. So if you're just looking into something, Jupyter Notebooks plus MLflow, it's the way to go. Then you have Spark for data streaming. And last but not least, OpenSearch, which historically is famous for as being a NoSQL database, but it can be used as a vector database. And any project that uses LLMs needs a vector database for storing its prompts. Then when it comes to canonical and what we do, I, I do love it. We do have a solution that includes these tools and a couple of others. And they are used really to fine tune, or what you can do is fine tune models, benefit from the, all these components being pre-integrated, Upgrading easily, easily and easier as well. Updating, but I'll move here. What do you do when you want to scale your project? First thing, and most important one, start with a use case. That's how you get started. You have a problem to solve. Don't think that you'll scale something that you're just doing for fun because it can work or it cannot work. Think of your users. Whereas now, you're likely to work on your own, on your machine. In three years from now, it's likely that you want to have a team of data scientists, and then you want them to be secured, to, to have clear isolation between their pipelines, for example, and so on. Think of how to optimize your resources. There are some reports that around 70% of the GPUs are underutilized, and that's sad. It's sad and unsustainable. You also have to bear in mind that it takes six months nowadays to get a GPU, so what do you do? Well, use and look for resource schedulers. There are many open source options for that, and then it really enables you to, on one hand, even get started with maybe resources that you have in place, but then also to optimize it in the long term. Look at the reproducibility of your work as well as portability. If you start, especially if you start on a public cloud and you might want to migrate, being able to to enable this will help you. Look at the monitoring. I didn't talk much about it, but you should have, and you should enable model monitoring, data monitoring as well, data drift monitoring, because otherwise it might be risky. You might have some malicious friends who try to, to play negatively with your models. And last but not least, look at the security and compliance. Um, there are plenty of packages that are being used in any machine learning project, from Python to NumPy to Pandas to, there are many of them, and many of them have vulnerabilities. There are more and more attacks. There was, last year there was a famous one called ShellTorch, or, yeah, I think it was ShellTorch called, or, or it, was, it was against uh, uh, PyTorch, and it, it really harmed a lot of organizations. Whereas when you have fun, it's okay, especially if you want to implement it in your organization, look at the security and compliance requirements. And 
all in all, have a long-term vision for your machine learning project, either if it's with large language models, either if it uses Gen AI, or it's just a traditional machine learning project, which doesn't look that interesting nowadays. I think it's still very useful. So just to recap, you should get started with a use case using open source tools. Try to be able to, or to enable reproducibility of your experiments and try to use solutions that run on any environment, whether it's public or private cloud. And then you should always scale with integrated solutions. And once you start scaling, look also for enterprise support. And that was me. That's where you have my contacts tomorrow, Jason. That's our boot number, or the day after. Tomorrow I'll be around if you want to talk more about AI. Uh, and I hope I stayed on time. Did I? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, I know we have some questions. Yeah? Oh, come on. That? No questions, it's okay. Do you get pushback when you make such a compelling case about machine learning versus LLMs? Because uh, there are some fanboys, right? I've, yes, yeah, sometimes I do get a pushback because we, we, do see, we do see people wanting to, to do the, and to play with the latest and greatest tools on the market, which I'm happy with and I encourage. At the same time, I don't think we should, especially as an organization, we should sell solutions that don't solve a problem. So I usually, when I push back, I, I try to, to come back and identify the use cases. It always starts with a problem. If there is no problem, there should not be a mach any machine learning project just because your friend does it across the street, you should not do it. The takeaways I get as a layperson who does not work on either side of that <laughs> is more cost effective, more flexible, with more focused results. Yes. So as a business owner, I'm like, I have fashion or I can run my business. It's kind of what I'm getting out of this. Yes. And that's probably unfair. Maybe someone's going to argue, but you make a compelling case. Thank you. I would also, there's a question there, Very but there is one more thing that I want to add, which is related to sustainability. We don't talk much, and there are reports that started to come up, but if you leave too many GPUs running in one place, they become environmentally unfriendly, and we should also bear that in mind and be very mindful and cautious of it. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned open search a couple of times, and uh, I used to work a lot with Elasticsearch. Open search, as far as I know, is just kind of a, a fork of that. And I'm wondering how exactly, it doesn't seem like machine learning or AI to me. That's more like parsing, tokenizing, and... It's... Open search initially was not designed for machine learning use cases. You're, you're right here. And it is, uh, it started once Elasticsearch went closed source. Um, it's used for storing prompt, the prompts from prompt engineering on LLM use cases, and uh, that's how it's being used. Okay, um, my name's Nathan, great presentation, thank you. And question is, you touched on like that, I love that multi-layered Venn diagram for machine learning and then like AI and then LLMs and all of that. So, you know, with the kind of the new, the new hotness that is LLMs and everything like that, I'm seeing a lot of people being like, can't we use an LLM for this? When you'd probably want to use something like traditional classification, you know, linear regression or something like that, right? So how would you guide or how would you kind of solution those, those conversations? To be like, hey, that's not the right thing for you in like the zero from hero to maybe you should be a hero in, in your regression instead of, you know, GPT-4. Usually it's a bit of a dance there because again, most of the people are attracted to work with the latest and greatest tools on the market. However, usually I, it goes back to their use case, their problem. I give examples of algorithms or similar success stories as well as timelines. I think when it comes to traditional machine learning, they can get better timelines because it's something that's been studying on, studied on the market. So I think it's a lot of consultancy that takes when you want to convince someone what's the right path to go. Uh, but as long as you position yourself as the expert in the room and you have the right arguments, which do need preparation, it should be easy. 
More questions? Yes. You mentioned you uh, built your chatbot there in the uh, uh, flow diagram. Do you have that set up as a script, or how, how, how can I set that up at home? I <laughs> <laughs> There's scripting in Inkscape. That's how it can be done. <laughs> Uh, we do have the the code actually open source. Uh, I can I can try to find it after that and I don't know share it with. I think Nathan probably. Yes. Okay. 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 Yes. We we can give access to that. At the same time, you have to bear in mind that the chatbot was really for internal purposes. So some of them, some of the questions and some of the things can be fun to to play with, like. We used to ask who, what is Ubuntu Pro and who's the, uh, who's the founder of Ubuntu, and it answered correctly in many languages. But then for some other things, it was not very well uh, optimized because we didn't want to. It was more of a pet project that we wanted to have. But I'll share with Nathan the, the code. Where do you see this going in the next couple of years? Oh, I love this question. I always said the future of AI is open source. And I'm not saying this because I'm here. That's what I truly believe. I think in the long run, it's going to, to be a shift in, the, in job roles. We're going to have experts in different industries uh, on AI projects, uh, which is very important. Also, I think that we'll see more companies and more people running or taking their projects to production rather than just having fun and playing around with, which is going to require a lot of upskilling. Better security, better monitoring are just a couple of things that I can think of. Also, I do expect actually to have more sustainability concerns and um, it's interesting because I know that, uh, for example, in the telco industry, which was also a very unsustainable industry, they do have projects nowadays to turn on and off the cell towers depending on how they are used. I think in the long run it's going to be the same with machine learning and I'm excited, I don't know, I'm curious. And also, I think it's going to, as a user, I think it's going to be, in a way or another, commoditized. Like, nowadays, we don't see that we get recommendations on Amazon when we buy things, but it's a machine learning algorithm behind it. I think we're going to see more and more applications in our lives that use machine learning, and we won't be like, ah, it's, a, it's an ML project, but rather, it's normal in our lives. You mentioned that step one was to have a use case. What advice do you have for companies that want to apply LLMs but don't have a use case yet? <laughs> no, I, if you don't have a use, I mean, it's a bit of an unpopular opinion, but I think if you don't have a use case, you should not try it out. But rather try to collaborate with um, research institutions, universities, that's where you find easy use cases, as well as public sector organizations. I think all organizations across the globe from very developed countries to maybe less developed countries are looking to digitalize different parts of their activity. Try to, as if you have a company, try to collaborate with them and identify their use case and try to help them out. Don't just do it because you wanna do it. I'm still against that. <laughs> Um, I work, I'm a statistician, I actually work in public health, and most of our statistical models are, are used in machine learning, and uh, so with statistical model, they're explainable because they're wrapped under the framework of hypothesis, like linear regression is actually a, a hypothesis framework for uh, correlation between uh, predictors or features and outcomes kind of deal. Um, with machine learning models such as, um, my thesis is actually on um, trees decision base and all that stuff. Um, it's more empirical base and not uh, much into um, theory in explaining. Do you see in the future if large language model, if there are going to be more research in how they work in terms of... Yes, and there are already papers being published on, on this topic. I think that explainability of any model is going to be a big topic in the near, in the upcoming years. And the main reason for that is that as organizations start adopting and start building their own ML models, 
there are going to be questions on the decisions that these models take. If you think of a credit risk analysis use case in a financial services institution, if I'm telling to a person you cannot get this credit, uh, you also need to explain why. And the organization will be eligible to all sorts of sanctions if they cannot explain why. And in order to explain why, they need to actually have an explainable model. And I think that, I, I mean, I know that there are a lot on, of investments in this area. A lot of papers are being published. I also think that it's still a topic that is not extremely mature. At the same time, open source models are more advanced on it than um, black boxes that are completely closed source. Thank you. I believe we are at time. Is that correct? Yeah. So no doubt more questions, but let's have a round of applause. That was great. Thank you. When your talk was submitted, I was excited because I wanted to see what Canonical's up to in this space. I didn't expect such a broad overview with enough details that we could all hook into presented so cleanly. It was a really great talk. Thank you. Thank you. One uh, thing that I didn't say is that when it comes to these tools that I had in one of the slides, they're all available by Canonical. You can just go on our website, deploy them, provide our feedback. You can find me on Discourse and Matrix, and not just me, but also the engineering teams behind it. They love the community feedback more, not more than I do, but uh, I interact with a lot of people. They don't interact that much, so they are really excited when, uh, when they see feedback coming in. If you try them out and uh, have feedback, just reach out to us. We are a message away, and some of us just a couple of miles away as well. That was great. Thank you. Um